So IBM has been working with Node.js for, for quite a while now. Um, we actually started our journey with the Node community in around 2013, um, and that was for two reasons. Um, we had, as Sarah's just mentioned, a number of our customers coming to us um, with an interest in Node because they were starting to build applications with it, and we had some IBM products that were interested in, in starting to use Node.js in some parts of uh, their components and architecture. So the first thing we did in 2013 was to um, start working on bringing Node.js onto IBM's platforms. So that meant bringing them to, to power architectures and to Z, which is inside mainframes, and that meant working with V8 um, and working with LibUV. Um, so over the years, our contributions in those areas have kind of grown quite significantly uh, to the point that we've got over 1,000 commits in each of those. Once we'd kind of worked on the platform porting and bring them to our platforms, the ne natural next stage of the evolution was to start working in Node Core itself, um, where we've worked on almost every single part of the Node Core platform. And again, from there, getting involved in some of the work groups around that became the obvious next step. And this was us working with our customers and our products and thinking about what was needed to continue to get Node to grow and looking at how we can invest in those areas. And we've been involved in performance benchmarking, in the build and release work groups, in internationalization, security, uh, the Node API work group, post mortem diagnostics, monitoring, um, almost every single part of the stack. And what that's meant is by the time that you get to, to now in 2018, um, IBMers have contributed over four and a half million lines worth of code to, to the core node projects. Um, and that doesn't include some of the work that we've done in projects around Node Core, so things like the loopback web framework and contributions to Express.js, which it builds on top of. So that's a fair amount of work that we've done over the last five years or so. Um, but 2018 has very much represented a, a shift in our focus. So none of this work is going away. Everybody that's been working on um, these parts of Node Core are continuing to do so. Um, but at the start of 2018, we started to look at whether there were other areas that we could start to invest and help in. And those have largely been around building cloud native APIs at scale. So the first thing we did was actually to stop doing something. Um, because of our work in bringing Node to the IBM platforms, um, originally, we were the only people that could build Node.js on AIX and Power and on the mainframe. So we used to have this thing called the IBM SDK for Node. Um, we got rid of that in April, and the main reason for doing that was we'd been working in the community to upstream all of our changes, to get build and test infrastructure available for the community to use, and working inside the build and release work groups to the point that there was no need for us to have our own builds anymore. And that's kind of simplified things for, for our customers. And it now means that we provide commercial support for the community builds rather than having to maintain our own. The next thing we did was starting to look at modules, that the ecosystem of 850,000 NPM modules and the difficulties in trying to make sure that you're building applications on a solid foundation. So we announced in June this concept of module LTS and aligning the long-term support policy of NPM modules to the long-term support policy of Node itself. The idea being that if you build an application on Node 8, the modules you're using should be supported for the lifetime of Node 8. So you shouldn't have to move major versions of a module inside the lifetime of the Node version that you're using. And all of the IBM-backed modules signed up to that. Um, the next thing we did was to provide uh, a website called Module Insights that runs a regression test framework and analysis over a whole set of node modules. So what that looks like is this. Um, at modules.cloudnative.js.io, we run an entire test matrix. Um, it's a limited set of modules at the moment, but that will expand based on people asking us to start bringing more modules into it. It will show you the latest test status across all of the versions of Node, across every supported platform of Node, and it will give you analysis of those modules in terms of what license they are, what the licenses are inside their dependencies, and what the test results are for each of the versions um, of those modules that we recommend people should be using. 
Now, that gives you a solid foundation to start building applications, but we said scalable, deployed as cloud native applications. So the other thing we announced was cloud native JS, which is a set of modules and assets that makes it easy to take any node application and get it deployed as a cloud native application inside Docker and Kubernetes and integrating with cloud native computing foundation technologies. So the first part of this was creating a, an open source repository under an Apache 2 license that provides all of this content. So inside the website, you've got access to um, modules that do things like health checking. So this is how most clouds will automatically restart an application that is marked as being troubled. We've provided assets for doing open tracing and Prometheus-based metrics to show you the state of your applications. Best practice Docker files for taking your application, building a slimmed down run image and deploying it into Kubernetes using something called Helm charts. So providing these templates makes it easy for you to get started and it provides all of the documentation that's required to take any application and get it deployed at scale with multiple replicas in Kubernetes. So that gets us to the point that you now have something deployed into the cloud. The last thing that we've um, got, and we're announcing that today, is the announcement of Loopback 4. So Loopback has been around for a number of years, but Loopback 4 is not just an evolutionary new major version on top of Loopback 3. It's a fundamental change to the framework that makes it much, much easier to build REST APIs and GraphQL APIs and get those deployed at scale for large applications. So in terms of Loopback 4 itself, um, Loopback has always provided a CLI to help you get started. Um, and Loopback 4 is no different. There is the Loopback 4 CLI. Uh, this gives you the ability to start scaffolding applications if you don't want to start from scratch yourself. So you've got the ability to build applications, controllers, data sources, and so on. You can scaffold out an app from an open API, so a swagger definition. Um, but this is just going to show you a quick example of um, a to-do list. So you can use the to-do list example to build your application. Um, and we can look at that in VS Code. And the first thing that's happened is you've got an application that's already structured for you to be composable using a series of controllers for your APIs, data sources, models, and repositories. Um, this makes full use of top TypeScript for optional typing. It uses decorators and annotations to be able to do dependency injection. And it makes it very, very easy to declare APIs, their allowable set of responses, and simple functions which are testable that implement that function for you. So this just implements a set of uh, to-do APIs for you. Now, that approach is critical for building large-scale APIs, because one of the things it will do for you is build the open API um, definition for you out of the box. That's both machine readable by the tooling ecosystem, but also provides you with the open API viewer, Swagger UI, as a way of being able to human readable, um, see the APIs and its documentation and be able to test your APIs directly in the browser. So I can add um, a, a to-do item and I can hit try it out and execute and it actually tests it directly for me in the browser. So all of this is designed for you and laid out but on top of that, we've now added support for GraphQL. And this is generated support for you. So there's a utility inside Loopback 4 called OAS Graph, which will allow you to take that open API definition, save it to a file, and ask OAS Graph to build you a GraphQL gateway specifically for that application. So without any effort required, you can start to build GraphQL on top of your REST APIs, and it will provide the schema to allow you to actually run GraphQL and it will make the REST call translation through the, under the surface for you. So we've now got to the point that we have started providing packages and assets for taking applications, getting them deployed using Cloud Native Computing Foundation capabilities into Docker and Kubernetes and making it much, much easier to build REST APIs and GraphQL APIs. Um, if you want to know more, Raymond Feng, my colleague, will be talking about Loopback 4 and OAS Graph tomorrow. Um, you can come to the IBM booth to find out about any part of this, 
and there is a workshop that is running at one o'clock today on taking an um, Express application and deploying it to Kubernetes using Cloud Native JS. Thank you.